Well, good afternoon, everyone, or it's just about good evening, really, isn't it? It must be close to five o'clock. Um, where's the pointer? Right, so I got asked to do this presentation on soil structure, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it as a bit of a team approach, not on the stage, it's just me here, but in terms of going out to some of my fellow colleagues that have been working in this uh, topic across the different CRIs, because there's also uh, um, Manaki Whenua land care research and plant and food research. Um, people have also been investigating this, um, this topic. So a uh, bit of a um, sing out to my colleagues, uh, John Drury, Weihu, Seth Lawrenson, and Sam Carrick as well. And collectively, this is a sort of a, bit of a, a, sort of a brain dump from us all, I guess, on this topic. So this is the, uh, the 101 part on soil structure. So um, it's critical to soil health. Uh, that's because it affects many processes and functions, water transport, uh, storage, gaseous exchange, biological processes. We've been learning all about those from the, the past few talks. Uh, all those soil functions go on to have a, an impact on soil ecosystem services, ones that we all recognize on farms, such as pasture production, the cycling of nutrients, and contaminant losses to water. So we can see that a lot of stuff, a lot of the action starts under the ground. What are the factors that influence soil structure? Uh, there's five key ones, and I'll just walk through them. Uh, so soil susceptibility to damage. This is essentially saying that uh, soils aren't invented equally. They, they are um, very different, and they behave very different, and aspects such as organic matter and car uh, sorry, clay content in particular, those things drive the susceptibility to the compaction in the first place. Uh, when you have a, a, a larger amount of, of well, for example, uh, the organic carbon or organic matter, it's like you've got a greater amount of glue, and it's a, it gives you a whole lot more soil strength and resistance. Soil wetness is an absolute key one, and I'm going to use this little diagram down the side to demonstrate that. So soil moisture content regulates so much of the, uh, of the compaction risk. When it's dry, you, you virtually don't have any compaction risk because you can't squash a soil if it's actually ho if it's holding strong. Um, and the structure itself is holding the weight of anything that's trying to compact it. As you get it a little bit wet, you, um, you sort of lubricate this, the, the soil a little bit more. It enables the pressure to squash some of the air out of the soil. Essentially, it squashes out the void space around the soil particles. When, you, when it's at its sort of prime for compaction is what we might call about field capacity, so it's full of water in terms of what it can store, certainly not saturated, that's when you're going to get the most compaction and it's, going to be, it's not going to be as strong to hold back the resistance and you're going to squash or t take out those large air spaces in the soil with the, the pressure of a hoof. When you get to this real wet end, so I'm talking saturated here, you can't compact a soil that has no air in it because all those voids are full of water. So instead, you're just moving it around. It becomes like soup and you're just, you're just moving it, um, it around like jelly and so that's when you see pugging instead. Uh, so soil wetness, absolutely key, but also important, livestock loading, that's in terms of the weight that comes through from the hoofs, you know, that's the difference between cows and sheep, for example. Grazing intensity, and we sort of look at that in terms of how many animals are in a given area, but also how long are they there for, those things are strong regulators in the damage that you'll see. And vegetative cover, that's come up through in a, a few talks already today about the importance of veg vegetative cover for other reasons, so there's a whole lot of synergies there. Uh, right, moving on to what does compaction or degradation look like? If you've got uh, an ideal soil, it's, you know, imagine it's like this, it's got a mixture of particles and air and water in it, and it's nicely arranged in aggregates. Uh, if you disrupt that and you, and you squash all the air out, you get a much more dense operation. On the other hand, if you've wrecked your soil, perhaps over cultivation, you can go down towards a, an aggregate breakdown situation and it can all be in, in sediment runoff. Uh, diagrammatically, it looks like this is a nice... Uh, well-structured soil through to something quite horrendous when it's full of mottling and, and glade and, and got lots of poor drainage issues and in real life it kind of looks like this. Here's your nice well-structured soil which would break up into crumbs in your hand versus something that um, breaks into best cricket balls that stays quite hard. I'm sure you all recognize those types of scenarios and that's sort of something in between. So measuring soil structure, how do we know when we've actually got a soil structural issue? Now, there's a range of different ways um, that you can do it and a range of different soil physical assessments which guide you towards different decision making. For example, available water capacity is more like a good one for, for understanding irrigation management implications. When it comes to understanding the potential for pasture production, we tend to focus on macro porosity because it has the greatest uh, yield relationship with pasture production. 
Um, it's actually still a technical uh, measurement though, so difficult. Farmers can go for visual soil assessment. There is some relationships between that and macro porosity. Soil quality is quite difficult though to understand and get a handle on across your farm because it's never the same. It's different between places. It's different between paddocks because of paddock management. It's different between around your farm based on soil types. Um, so that's that spatial distribution. Um, there's also temporal variation uh, because it changes all the time in relation to when it's damaged versus when it's recovering mode. And so at different times of the year, you would always expect it to be in a different state as well. So that makes monitoring quite difficult. But a bit of a recent headline's come out, uh, this latest MFE report, Our Land, April 2021, and it's now showing that um, from the data gathered nationally, 65% of dairy and 48% of dry stock sites are reported as having a, a higher than optimal macro porosity. Uh, looking now, I want to talk about pasture response to compaction as a mechanism for damage and pasture response to pugging. So starting off with compaction. This occurs in response to multiple cumulative events. It's not, this is, you don't compact your soil usually from one event. It happens, it's a result of your stocking intensity and the soil type and the risk to damage. And over time, you can see a yield penalty. So you get what you might call a mild yield penalty. With good water and nutrition or nutrient supply, you can continue to grow plenty of grass, but you, you pay a yield penalty. I just want to quickly walk through this example. This is from a some research undertaken in North Otago on a pallet soil a few years back. It's this accumulation of about five years' worth of data. In the brown columns here, we've got uh, macro porosity, and in the green, we've got pasture yield. Cattle irrigated versus cattle dryland. Not surprising that the cattle dryland was a greater compaction, sorry, a greater macro porosity, so less compaction than the cattle irrigated, and other way around for pasture growth, because if you supply all that extra water in a dryland environment, you can, you can overcome any um, soil physical limitations, or overcome many of them. Uh, but to understand what, I guess, the yield penalty potentially is, you can now we compare it to sheep irrigated, so you bring that context in. Sheep irrigated held a very good macro porosity, even though it was irrigated, the livestock loading is so much lower, so the pressure's lower onto that, onto that soil type. Yet the pasture has stayed up, um, it's actually, so it ends up being, so you've got a, a big difference sort of macro porosity, a much greater there, and you get that small difference, so it was sort of about 8, 10% um, pasture yield benefit from not having that, uh, the much greater compaction present in the, in the cattle scenario. So it's that sort of mild depression of yield, but it's continuous and it's always there. Oh, I'm just going to make a note here. Ryegrass pulling seems to be related to compaction. Anecdotally, a lot of farmers struggle with it. Research-wise, it uh, remains an enigma in terms of another um, sort of a nut we need to crack. I'm actually wondering now if we need to talk to Xinjing about the microbiome and where that might fit into the um, phenomenon of ryegrass pulling. It's certainly a bigger issue at pasture establishment. Right, now moving on to pasture response to pugging. This is the opposite to compaction. This is when it responds to a single damage event. You put the, your, uh, your animals onto a very wet soil, put a lot of them, the more you have, the worse it is, especially the longer they're on there, and you'll pay a big yield penalty. Uh, this is a, an AgriSearch Tread Ready Reckoner tool, and it sort of gives you a good indication of how grazing duration and stocking density, and the two of them create a relationship for the types of yield penalty you will suffer in the immediate month following the pugging event. So, you know, if you have a very high duration and a very high grazing, you can see a greater than 50% reduction in pasture yield. Uh, wouldn't be any surprise to people that have uh, experienced um, extreme pugging. And the other thing around the corner here in this whole pugging space is the uh, essential freshwater policies that are coming through at the moment with a, with a new pugging rule proposed uh, that will come out, and that will definitely have some impacts on, likely impacts on where probably winter grazing, because it's targeting winter grazing, where those winter grazing um, paddocks will be placed in the future. Okay, going, moving now on to repairing damage. So if you've got damage, what can you do? The good news is soil does like to repair itself. It's got a, uh, a bunch of natural processes, particularly around climatic differences and freeze-thaw, wet-dry cycles, which promote uh, re-aggregation of soil. And earthworms are your friend, so they will also uh, very much aid in that development of uh, aggre uh, soil aggregation formation. It also helps if you're in that phase and you're relying on, um, on natural repair that you, uh, that you take the pressure off the soil a little bit. So decreasing the grazing pressure to help promote recovery by decreasing the intensity of grazing or changing the animal class will certain, certainly uh, uh, fast track that recovery process. Or there's mechanical aeration where you 
you rip up the soil to break up a, um, a pan. Um, that is a, well, it's a rapid short-term fix. Uh, I would only recommend it though when you're dealing with a highly compacted soil because it is the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff in terms of a management strategy. Um, and it can be quite expensive if you're not seeing any return on your investment because you don't have enough of compaction to, to actually warrant it in the first place. And again, just to work, walk you through another example, uh, also in North Otago, here we had about four or five years of continuous winter forage cropping, so it really damaged our soil. We're getting out some very low macro porosities here. Um, at this point in time, we decided we would uh, turn it to pasture again. We would allow one half of the trial to um, to just see what if we could get a natural recovery in macro porosity, and the other half we would aerate it. So the aeration goes straight up, gives you a brilliant macro porosity initially, but it doesn't hold. Uh, within 18 months, you're back to the same point where the natural recovery came up and met at anyway, showing that you have to grow a lot of extra grass in this part here to pay for the aeration in the first place. Uh, preventing, uh, this is obviously better than repairing. Um, so you have a few sort of uh, tactical and strategic options that farmers have and, and you usually use. If you've got a range of soil types on your farm, really that is the best way. If you know where your soil types are that are less resistant to the damage in the first place, i.e. well-drained soil, use them in the higher risk time. they are a lot more resistance to compaction in the first place. Um, that's gonna be your best bet. If you've only got heavily poorly drained soil types, off-grazing systems are, an, are a tool to help avoid that, um, you know, animal shelters, standoff facilities to help decrease that risk and damage. But there's a whole lot of farm system implications you need to be aware of. Your dung returns is totally different now. You're increasing extra cost into your system. You're potentially changing your pasture quality at the same time, the more you use that system. Cultivation, I actually didn't write it up there, but cultivation is a critical one as well in terms of all decreasing cultivation. Uh, tactical around, um, you know, around the way you utilize your breaks, break feeding, particularly around not over-compacting certain areas, uh, maintaining or decreasing stock density, maintaining higher pasture residuals. In the interest of time, I'm nearly in the end. Uh, this is where I was sort of thinking, oh, we've, we've still got some issues around m and telling our story around soil structure and how it affects the big picture. We understand it at a, at a plot scale and, and at a paddock scale. As soon as you start um, dealing with it at farm to catchment scale, some of the impacts are, are harder to, um, to pick up, and that's because of that whole temporal and spatial variation that I was talking about. Um, it's constantly in a damage and recovery cycle. Uh, even if you have a highly damaged area, it often only accounts for a small part of your property at any one time, and therefore it's hard to quantify that through, particularly at catchment scales into implications for production, finances, hydrology, contaminant losses, and so there's definitely more work to be done in that modeling and field validation space to understand the impacts at multiple scales. Have we got time to whip through my conclusions? So sure. fast, right. Soil structure and function are important because they deliver all those ecosystem services that we want from, from healthy soil. We're seeing national and regional uh, monitoring demonstrating or showing that it's gonna be an issue or it's an, it is an increasingly an issue around our soil structure. There is guidance to repair and prevent soil compaction. A big issue is emerging around farmer management for avoiding pugging with new pugging rules coming in. And as I just explained, the, uh, there's a whole lot more understanding required to interpret changes from scale, from particularly from paddock through to through to farm, through to catchment. Thanks for your attention.